Our goal is to be fruitful. We don't measure success by numbers, by dollars, by personalities. Let's let His light shine in us and through us so we can act as guides through darkness and lighthouses in the storms. I think the waiting is the sweetest intimacy that we can have with Jesus. This is your prayer in our lives, so we pour out our praise to you all. As Christians, the Word of God is our foundation. Scripture tells us to be the salt and light of the world. We are to let our light shine before everyone so that others may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Christians are indeed born into the world, but more aptly, we are sent into it to fill the world with the light of Christ. This is Living Truth. Oh, good morning. I'm very shortly going to read some verses from Deuteronomy chapter 8. But as this is my last Sunday, as your pastor, I'm going to just say one or two personal things as well uh, before we start that and read that passage. I believe that this church is at its healthiest that it has been in the 15 years that we have been here. I don't say that lightly at all. I believe that. I believe that for the last couple of years. And I want to suggest five reasons why this is so. One is because of the spiritual substance of you, the congregation. The hunger that is here for God, the love that is here for his word. You know, somebody told me about two weeks ago that the People's Church congregation have a high tolerance for long sermons. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, there's another way of looking at that. And that is the people have a high appetite for the word of God and for the truth of God. And one of the great joys of ministering here is the fact that you're receptive and hungry to the Word of God. I love to see the Bibles that are open around the building when we're reading them together. I love to hear the rustle of the pages. Not because there's something in that in itself. It is simply symptomatic of the appetite that so many have here for the Word of God. Second reason I believe we're healthy is because we are an activist church. We're not just sitting in the pews. We have 1,600 active volunteers, I am given to understand, within the congregation. That is just for those ministries that are either within the church regular program or related to the church outside in the wider community, but there are many, many others I know who are involved in numerous ministries and numerous outreaches who are not part of that number because th that is not uh, a category of people that we have record of. This church is more involved locally than it has ever been in uh, many years, and we rejoice in that. It's involved regionally and, of course, globally. And one of the great features of the People's Church throughout its history has been its global vision, its global activity. And in the day of uh, relatively ease of transport, uh, many of you have been to different parts of the world now, some in short-term mission teams, and you've seen at first hand some of the work that God is doing, some of the work that we're invested in. And I think this being an activist church creates the appetite as well for the Word of God. When you're active, you've got to have your right resources, and you get the right resources. If you 
start living off wrong resources, we will drain out. Third thing I'd say is that we are a younger church. We're getting younger. Uh, we have lots of new families. I'm told, again, by those who work these things out, that the average age of the congregation has dropped by 20 years, at least, over these years. In fact, looking around, I can safely say this now. There was a speaker we had some years ago. He said, it's like looking out over a box of Q-tips. <laughs> That's what he said. I didn't say that. I'm just quoting him. But now we're a load of blackheads. <laughs> Something else. We love the senior folks, and we want the Word of God and it's truth to go on impacting their lives. Some of the godliest people here are the older folks. But we don't want to keep it to the older folks. We want the next generations to be connected with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember the first week I was here, I brought two of my children to the youth activity. And there were 13 people, including my two children, in that group. I remember leaving them, going and buying a cup of coffee and sitting in the coffee shop before going back to pick them up and thinking, Lord, what is it you want to do with young people in this area? And so we are a younger church. We are, fourthly, an ethnically diverse church. That ought not to be much of a surprise because we live in such an ethnically diverse city, perhaps the most diverse city in the world. But it is not diversity for its own sake. We have never made it a goal. The goal has been that this church centers around Jesus Christ and centers around not only who he is, but what he does. And that, we are utterly convinced, breaks through every culture, every gender, every generation, if we do that well. And it's been wonderful to see the many, many different representatives of this city coming in and being part of this church. And I love that verse in Revelation 7 and verse 9, which uh, this is just the beginning of. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, says John. And they were from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. And they were standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. And in a very embryonic way, we experience that week by week. There have been two speakers that have been here from other parts of the world to minister to us who have made the comment to me, we will give anything for a congregation like this. And I've heard it said by others too that we are possibly the most diverse congregation in the world. And uh, I don't know how we would ever be able to measure that, but that certainly is a source of great joy. It's a source of strength in our ministry. We can show the world that unity is not externally imposed. It is internally created when Jesus Christ lives within the human heart. And the fifth reason I think we are strong is because of the excellent staff that God has given to us. You don't see most of the staff. You just see a very small sector here Sunday by Sunday. You don't see uh, many of the folks who work in our finance administration department, human resources, keeping this place clean and tidy and painted. You don't see most of those folks here on a Sunday that you would identify who they were. You don't see them in action in that way. We, we don't see the folks who are working in living truth behind closed doors as far as we here are concerned, about 25 folks who are working full-time with living truth. We don't see some of the global outreach team. And there's so many, many ministries going on, so many fruitful ministries that are not always visible on a Sunday morning. But God has given us a very wonderful team because that is our goal. Our goal is to be fruitful. We don't measure success in 
by numbers, by dollars, by personalities. We must measure by fruitfulness that people's lives are being changed and transformed. But having said all that as a preamble, I do want to read to you now from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 1, where the Israelites are very shortly to enter into the land of Canaan. This whole letter was written weeks before they entered Canaan. And I want to read you the first four verses of chapter 8. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that a man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during those long 40 years. 40 years earlier, God had intervened and brought Israel out of Egypt they have been on this long, tedious journey through the wilderness. They're now about to enter Canaan. Moses is also about to die, just as they were to enter Canaan and to be replaced by Joshua, a new, young, vibrant leader who would take them in and enable them to occupy the land that God has, had promised to them. And I want to just talk about three things. They're reminiscing here, you see. That's why I'm speaking from these verses. And the first thing is in verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years. Remember, this was not a human enterprise. This was a divine enterprise. As, of course, the church of Jesus Christ is not a human enterprise. It is a divine enterprise. Human wisdom is not enough. It's all we bring within ourselves, but it's not enough. Human strategy is not enough. The church is not a business operating on business principles. We need to make good business sense of what we do. But we go beyond that level, beyond that layer, beyond that sphere of thinking into the divine, godly receiving of wisdom and direction. The headquarters of the church are in heaven. His strategist is the Holy Spirit. That's why the church is not an organization in, in the New Testament. It's an organism. It is a body relating to the head, which is the Lord Jesus, living in the power of its life, which is the Holy Spirit. And he guides, he doesn't just show us direction and then get on with it, he guides us. And in the 40 years of Israel's experience in the wilderness, God had been leading them, providing for them, reproving them, correcting them, training them, equipping them, and now at last bringing them into the land that he had promised to them. You know, we best see the guidance of God in retrospect, I suggest to you. We trust him as we, we move along, but we're on a journey that is full of unknowns and full of uncertainties, full of fears. We get a hint here that something may be right. We get a whisper over here that something may be right. And we seek to move accordingly, but we do so, if you're like me, and I think most of us are similar we do so with some doubt in our minds. Is this really the right thing? Is this really from God? But as we step out in faith and you look back 
In retrospect, it is then and there that you see the hand of God and you see what he was doing all the time. And so God says, listen, guys, remember these 40 years. I led you. What? We got into a famine. Yes, we got into a place with no water. I led you. I was guiding you. And I brought you to the land of your forefathers. Sometimes the promises of God seem a long, long time coming. But in the meantime, we may store a whole treasure house of memories that we look back in the course of time and they all begin to make sense. If you follow a murder mystery, little things happen here and little things happen there and somebody drops his pipe over here and you have no idea of the significance of those things until you get to the end and the detective puts it all together, tells man, you go back to the story. You never watch the same one twice because you know it all now. All the little things that meant nothing then mean a lot now when you look back with hindsight. And the will of God is often like that. We build memories of how God has led us. And then at the end, with retrospect, we look back and we see his hand. I first came to speak at the People's Church 30 years ago this year now. The previous year, I had been speaking at what was then Ontario Bible College and Ontario Theological Seminary, now it's Tyndale University. And back in those days, in September, they had a week, which they called a spiritual emphasis week, early in the year, where the classes didn't take place, but they had a whole week of focusing on what actually is the Christian life. What are the foundational issues from which we must not, cannot depart? And I've been invited to speak for that week. I've done it before, back in the 70s, actually, as well, at, at uh, OBC. But I was there uh, that week, and I was speaking every morning. And then I was driving out to Mississauga, and I was speaking every night in a church called Sheridan Park Alliance Church in Mississauga. And I was staying out there, driving in. On the Thursday morning that week, as I drove in, the girl at the reception desk said to me, I have a message for you. So she gave me the paper. It said, would you please call Dr. Paul Smith at the People's Church? So later that day, I called him. He said, I'd like to have a cup of coffee with you. Could you come sometime so I can come tomorrow morning after the last of the uh, OBC sessions? So I came down here. Uh, went into his office and uh, we had a cup of coffee together and while we were having the cup of coffee, I remember he raised his hand and pointed at me like this and said, I want you at the People's Church. I said, what do you mean? I want you to come and speak for a month. I want you to speak every Sunday, morning and evening. There were evening services then. I want you to speak every Tuesday night. We'll have a, a Bible conference on Tuesday nights. Well, we looked at our diaries and the first months that we had available that was suitable both for him and for me was two years away. So we planned it for June in uh, 1987. He said, well, I'd like you to come sometime before that so people know who you are when I announce that we're going to have this month uh, with a speaker. Would you, would you come sometime in 86? So I came in October 86. That was the first time I spoke here, just for a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening. And interestingly, last Sunday, a lady came to me at the end of the service, and she said, I was here the first Sunday you ever spoke in the People's Church 30 years ago. I said, good for you. She said, I remember what you spoke about. I said, you have a better memory than me. <laughs> and, and so then she told me what I spoke about. And I said, Wow, that sounds good. I, I <laughs> totally forgotten about that message. And so I made notes of it when I'm back to my room. So I must <laughs> regurgitate this one. But I have no idea what I spoke about. We came back, the whole family, Hillary, and our children, we came back. We only had two children then. Came back for the months in, uh, of June and uh, preached every week and Tuesday nights. And on the last Sunday... Sunday morning service, all, all the pastors sat on the platform. I was standing over here during the hymn before I preached, standing here, and Paul Smith turned to me and he said, have you ever thought about being a pastor? 
Well, I had a standard answer to that question at that time. I said, I've never committed a big enough sin to have to be a pastor. <laughs> so then he said, how would you like to pastor this bunch and did this with his hand? <laughs> Hillary, sitting at the back there somewhere, saw this and knew exactly what he was saying. I said, I can't talk about it now. I'm going to have to speak at the end of this verse. <laughs> and so I came up and I preached, sat down. When I sat down, he got up and he said, I want to say thank you to Charles for being here, blah, blah, blah. I want to give you some advice. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, but only for five years, and then come and be pastor of the People's Church. Well, people didn't know what to do, so they clapped, because that's what you do. You don't know what else to do. <laughs> so he said, uh, that's how we do business here. That was the, the church meeting. That was the vote. It's on. <laughs> well, at the end of that service, I said to him, that was a little unusual. <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, but I, I mean it. Actually, he never once ever again talked to me about it. Other people talked about it because actually he put it in the public domain. I got home to England and two days later, I got home, went home Monday night, flew home Tuesday morning. Alan Redpath, who used to preach us, some of you know him, well-known man of God. He's been in heaven for many years now. He telephoned me. This is the day we got home and said, what's this I hear about you're going to be the pastor of the People's Church? <laughs> I said, wherever did you get that? He said, a friend of mine in Chicago called me and told me. <laughs> and he said, what do you know about Charles Price? I hear he's going to the people's church. So we had to put out fires all the time after that. For, for a few years, eventually, they all went out. And um, uh, that was fine. We, we hadn't given any thought to coming here. It wasn't something we especially felt would be right because we so were engrossed in what we were doing in England, but uh, uh, the year 2000, I think it was, I came to speak at the Toronto Spiritual Life Convention, which is organized by an interchurch committee, and I was on the platform one night during that week. It was held here at the People's Church, and I had a strange feeling that everything in this building was completely familiar to me, every brick, every seat, every color, which isn't difficult because it's green, but... Uh, <laughs> Everything was familiar. And it was a strange thing. It came very strongly as though I really belonged, and then it went. I nearly talked to somebody about it because it was such a vivid sense, and I didn't. I'm glad I didn't. I went home. I told Hillary what I had experienced, and she said, you know, I had the feeling when you're in Toronto, you come back and tell us something which will change our lives. So I have no idea what that will change. Uh, but a few weeks later, somebody sent me an email to say that John Hull had given his resignation and was leaving. And uh, when I read that email, both Hillary and I together said, this is what it's about. We will do nothing to show any interest. If this is from God, it'll come to us. It may not be, but we think this is what it's about. And a few weeks later, I was in California speaking at a conference, and Reg Andrews, who was then the executive pastor, called me and said, as you know, John is leaving. We're needing people to fill the pulpit until we get a new pastor, would you be free on one of the weekends we've got available to come? I said, what weekends do you have? He gave me a whole list of them. I said, Reg, I'm sorry, I'm not free on any of those weekends. I can't come. He said, okay, well, worth a try. Put the phone down. If I really, really wanted to, I could have changed one of those because, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily things that were in concrete. But I phoned Hillary and I said, Hillary, I've just had a phone call from the People's Church uh, asking me to speak on a Sunday and I've declined. She said, good. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, we had another phone call from Reg and he said, we've had a cancellation. Would you be free on a certain weekend? And I'd kept that weekend to be at home with my family. So I said, yes, we'll come. So uh, I came on that occasion. Hillary came on a later occasion. And it was in September 2001 that we arrived here to take up this role as, uh, as the, the senior pastor. We weren't looking for it. It wouldn't have been on our list of the things we'd most like to do in ministry. Uh, but we came with an absolute conviction that God had led us here. And I think in most of our lives, we, we, we learn to recognize the pattern of God's leading in our own experience. It's different for all of us. There's no, there's, there's no fixed way God guides people. 
There may be some principles, but one of the issues that surrounds the way we have experienced guidance is that often God will, will just plant something in your mind. It may be a thought, maybe a sensation, maybe an idea, and, and you just plant there. And you think, well, is this, is this from God or is it not? And I think when it comes to the big issues of life, it's always good to wait until there is some external confirmation of what you're internally feeling without saying anything about it to anybody. A lot of virtue in keeping things quiet. A lot of virtue in, with Mary pondering these things in her heart and telling no one. Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road was told he would preach to the Gentiles. He would suffer much for the sake of the gospel. He went back to Jerusalem now, a converted man. They were very untrusting of him except Barnabas. And so he went back to Tarsus in Asia Minor, his own city. He now could no longer function as a Pharisee. So he learned a trade as a tent maker. And about 12 years later, Barnabas was now leading the church in Antioch. He needed some help. He went to Tarsus, found Saul, said, would you come and help me? He came to, to Antioch. He helped Barnabas in Antioch for a year. And at the end of that year, the leaders, the elders of the church, were praying and fasting and worshiping. And the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. Saul of Tarsus waited in total about 13 years. God told him something in his heart. He didn't preempt it. He didn't start prematurely and be operating purely in human effort. He waited until God, through other people, set him apart. I think that's a, that's a good principle. It's a principle we have operated by, really. And uh, it is his business to guide us. You know, when Jesus said to six of his 12 disciples, when he met them and he invited them to go with him, he said, follow me. Peter, James, Andrew, John, Philip, Matthew. To those six, he used those two words, follow me. Now, that's a very inadequate invitation, don't you think? If I came to you at the end of this service and said, follow me, what's the first thing you'd say? Where are you going? Of course it would be. Where are you going? If you ever noticed, never wondered why, nobody ever said to Jesus, where are you going? Because the Christian life is not about where we're going, it's about who we are with. It's come to me. Where are we going? None of your business. <laughs> this is your business. Come to me. In fact, the three invitations Jesus gave, get these three right, and the rest of the Christian life will fall into place much more than if you get these three wrong. First invitation, come to me. You're weary, burdened, come to me. Second invitation, abide in me. Now you've come to me, live in me and I in you and live in this intimacy of relationship because that is where you bear fruit. So having come to me, abide in me. And the third one is learn of me. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Everything else will follow that. There is no agenda outside of coming to me, abiding in me, and learning from me. Then your life is Christocentric, and out of that will flow everything else of value. Going back to Deuteronomy 2, I'm just hanging some thoughts on these, these verses. He goes on to say this, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. It was the Lord who led you through the desert. You know, we're not invited in the Christian life to take a stroll in the sunshine through a beautiful rose garden by a babbling brook and then to arrive on warm, sunlit uplands. That's not the invitation. There is a wonderful, glorious destination to this journey, but the journey itself 
is a road through a desert. Deserts are spoken of in scripture and desert roads are spoken of as noble places to be. In Isaiah 40, God speaks of a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. There's a road, there's a highway, but it's in the desert, it's in the wilderness. Not make a a pathway around the desert, but in the desert. We've talked many times about this principle, I suppose, that deserts are part and parcel of our Christian life. Never measure something as being in the will of God by the fact everything is going well. And conversely, never think that you're out of the will of God or must be out of the will of God if things are going badly or wrong. The journey is through the desert, and as we'll see in the next clause in just a moment, it is in the desert you learn things you would never learn on the highway, never learn in comfort. And so God leads us through deserts. Our journey has been through various deserts, There have been cul-de-sacs along the way that we've sort of steered into and thought, well, that's not going anywhere. That's a dead end. I'm not going to talk about most of those in detail. Just just one I might mention, which is um, a purely physical uh, thing. When we arrived here, we had a temporary residence permit, and uh, we applied for a permanent residency uh, permit. And uh, eventually, after three independent medical examinations, I was refused on the grounds that my heart health was such that I'd be a very expensive proposition for OHIP. (laughs) And so on those grounds, they rejected our applications to stay. Our lawyer, our immigration lawyer, said, you can appeal but I've never known any appeal be successful. There is no further evidence to give in your favor. We've given it all. But we appealed anyway. It just so happened that a physician from this congregation was dealing with a patient who was a gentleman very high up within the government of this country. You would know his name if I gave it to you. And just in conversation, as he was playing around with his heart, (laughs) (laughs) he said, I have a patient, da-da-da, and told him my story. He's appealed the case and waiting for the response from the appeal. He said, I'll look into it. And apparently, so the story as I received is, he went back to Ottawa and he asked for a report on the process of my appeal. And he got a report back saying that it had been lodged, but nothing yet done about it. So a week, I think it was, and maybe in a month, a week or two later, he asked for another report, and the report came back and said it is still waiting in the list. So nothing had happened. So apparently, he said, I wanted a report of the status of this uh, application on my desk every day until you've made a decision. That's pressure, isn't it? (laughs) The next day, we had a permanent residency (laughs) permit. (laughs) We don't want to cheat the system, but they say it's not, it's who you know, isn't it? (laughs) And then we quickly became Canadian citizens, so you cannot kick us out anymore because we, (laughs) we belong. But there are experiences like that that uh, said, God, okay, if this is of you, if we're here because you want us to be here, this is your business and we'll trust you to bring it about. And uh, it's not a walk in a lush forest. 
Any kind of public role invites criticism, and critics are good for you, good for us, because if you're wise enough to say what lies behind this and is there something in this, maybe they've worked out some details that are not, but go back to what lies behind it. Is there something behind this that you really ought to know and to, uh, and to listen to? And uh, I am thankful for some who have uh, sent criticism. I don't read anonymous letters, by the way. Haven't had any now for quite a while. They used to come in nonsense from people like a concerned sister or uh, a beloved brother uh, or someone who knows more than you do. You know, this. <laughs> but I never read them. When they come, my assistant just sees it anonymous. Goes to, she reads my letters first, you see, <laughs> just to say, oh, this isn't a good one. Um, and uh, straight into the bin. So I never see them. I just say, oh, I had three last week. But we have them for some time now, so thank you. You anonymous people who have stopped writing them. We, we appreciate it. But, uh, but actually, only cowards write anonymous letters. They haven't the guts to stand up to what it is they feel concerned about. But I'm just saying, there's a, there's a, a density element to the journey that we walk with God. But the third thing is that he said then in verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your hearts. One of the best ways of knowing what is in our hearts is getting into difficult times. And in those difficult times, it will either draw out of us a pride, a resistance, an arrogance, a self-defense, or it may draw out of us a spirit of humility. And you don't need me to say to you that in the Christian life, there are no grounds for anything other than humility. A proud Christian is an oxymoron. An arrogant Christian is an offense because they are denying what they claim to believe as a Christian. Because as a Christian, we're recipients of grace and grace alone. We realize apart from him, we are nothing, can do nothing, we're separated forever, etc. And so we can only but walk humbly. But we have to keep being reminded of that. And so God deprived them of food in the desert. He fed them with something that would keep them alive, the manna. But he's saying here that, that uh, he humbled you in that process. You know, one of the things which humbles us is not having things we feel entitled to. They felt entitled to food, and so they rose up. God, why have you brought us out here? We're sick of the food that's here. Give us some, etc. And uh, when God did not feed them, it had the effect of of humbling them. There's a verse in Hosea looking at this time where God says, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. They had plenty to eat. They became satisfied. They were satisfied. They became proud. They were proud. They forgot me. Where did that links of that chain begin? When I gave them too much. That's why the, the whole doctrine of prosperity is insidious, because it does not create the humility and the serving spirit that God is working in our hearts. Don't associate the blessing of God with material prosperity in itself. God may well prosper you materially, but many of us here have traveled in areas of the world where we've met materially deprived Christian people and discovered a rich experience of God in their hearts, a rich generosity in their hearts. In fact, in James chapter 2 and verse 5, James says, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Is now the virtue in poverty in itself, 
nor is there virtue and riches in and of themselves. But the easier baggage to carry that keeps us dependent and humble before God is being deprived, not overabundance. I think that's one reason why fasting is a healthy discipline in the New Testament. I don't know too much about fasting. I think one of it must be because you deny yourself something you otherwise have access to and have a right to. I'm going to deny it, and the effect in your heart is humbling. And so God says, I, I humbled you as well. And this is the reason, verse 3, humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you. The man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I deprive you of bread so that you discover that your real sustenance comes from the word of God. And when our troubles, when our tribulations, when our illnesses, when our fears, when our bereavements drive us to God, they have become friends, and we're nurtured. And so look back, says God to the Israelites, remember how I led you these 40 years. You can see it now, because you're about to enter Canaan. You look back in hindsight. You can see it now in a way you couldn't then. Remember how the Lord led you. And it was in the desert the desert wasn't the mistake. And it was to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart. And so now, having done that, he says, we're going to be ready to possess that which God promised on oath to your forefathers. And you'll move into this rich experience and stage that God had for the people of Israel. So that's my last word to you. Remember how God has led you. And forgive my indulgence in sharing a little bit about how he's led us in relation to being here. Remember the road is supposed to be a desert road. Remember that when you're on it. And remember God is testing us to produce humility in our hearts and lives. God bless you. The work of the Holy Spirit begins on the inside, aligning our hearts and minds with God. It's a work in progress and we may not always get it perfect, but eventually we can't help but to share God's word with the world around us. That prompting deep within our hearts is Christ transforming our lives. There's a familiar expression, hindsight is 2020. When we look back, some things that were not obvious from the outset are now much clearer. We're able to evaluate and find meaning in the events that have taken place. This is often how it is in our walk with God. We choose to trust Him as we journey through the unknowns and uncertainties of life. And when we look back, we can see His hand and know that He has been working in our lives all along. Do either of you have any personal examples of this? You've gone through something in your life. You may or may not have known that God was at work, but in hindsight, looking back, you could totally see his hand in the time. Definitely, I think that for most people, including myself, it was during a season of great difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was dying with a terminal illness, and I actually had everything kind of pulled out from under my feet. So there was a lot of, where is this going? It looks like it's a permanent dead end. Um, but now, from my role here, the work that I do, so much has to do with my ability to sit with people in their season of not knowing and, and having to trust. And because I've been there, I'm so much more able to speak into those moments. So mm. God was equipping me for what I do now. But at the time, it was just about daily dependence mm. and trust. As I listened to Charles' sermon, the, the thought came to me, the question, you know, what is the greater posture of faith? Somebody who says that because I know God says this, this, and this, therefore this, this, and this is going to happen. Mm. Or the person who is able to say, 
I have trusted God and I can look back and see God led me here, he led me there. And sometimes it's, it's the normal day-to-day -day things. It's a, it's a phone call or it's a canceled appointment. You know, God works in all of these things mm -hmm. to weave his plan into our lives. Mm. It's not a situation of needing to bear down and, and hear a, the voice of God. He's faithful to his word and he's faithful to us. Did it change your view of the situation? You know, once you were able to look back and you had the information, you know, sort of seeing what God was doing, did it change how you felt about it? Definitely, because when you're in the moment, you're kind of fists in the sky, what's going on, where mm -hmm. are you? And when you're not really hearing anything back, it's very scary. Mm -hmm. So on the other side, when things finally start to fall into place and you see the big picture of what God is doing, you appreciate the beauty, even in you know the analogy of a painting, there's the dark strokes. And when you're in that dark shadow of the painting, it's a very scary and lonely place. Mm -hmm. But when you are able to finally then step back and see the beauty of the great creation of what it is, then there's a lot of joy mm. and a lot of hope and mm -hmm. rejoicing. Yes, God yeah. came through again and yes, he's here. Yeah, it's like that analogy about the tapestry with all the knots mm -hmm. and it looked all mm -hmm. gnarly and then the person saw it flipped over and it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's what God sees, right? He sees yeah. the purpose behind all those knots and the dark colors, yeah. And I think we need to also remember that we're all individuals and the Lord deals with us as individuals. So my experience through a certain trial may not be the same as Lily's, it may not be the same as yours, mm -hmm. uh, but the Lord deals with us on an individual basis and knows what we can take at any given time. And he will not allow us to take on more than, than we can bear with his help. What about situations where you have a decision to make? So. You know, some of the things we've been talking about are things, making sense of things that are just happening in life. But there's times where there's something important and you may feel a direction, but you're not sure. And it's something that matters, like some of those big life issues. Do I do this or do I do that? I think maybe God is leading me this way, but I'm not sure. How do you, how do you handle that? I've gone through a couple of career changes. Okay. So those are big life moments and uh, defining times when you really need to know that it is the voice of the Lord that's, that's leading. And you don't always have that clarity necessarily. Uh, so I, thinking back to a couple of situations where I've, I've had these um, life-changing experiences, the Council of Brothers and Sisters in mm -hmm. Christ, being yeah. part of a, a vibrant, loving community is extremely important and having those people that are important in your life feeding into your decision. Uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit is always there and he will bring things and he will prompt you with, with thoughts and with ideas and with the, with the word. And then of course, is the word of God itself. As you spend time in the word, there is clarity that the Lord, that, that the Lord gives. I think the first step in what you're saying is that listening, listening to God and, so often we're just too busy to spend that time to listen. And what's really helped me build my relationship with God is journaling. I find I spend a lot of time talking to God, but when I journal, I make room to listen to what God has to say to me. And then I do exactly what Reg says. So I'll, I'll find Bible verses that resonate with the direction I think the Holy Spirit is guiding me in. And then I will always try to find some counsel and, and say, this is what the Holy Spirit is prompting me. Does that resonate with you? What, what do you think? Can, can you pray with me and, and see if that mm. is something that we can confirm together? Mm. So in the message today, we talked about Saul's journey on the road to Damascus and you know that incredible experience. What we sometimes forget is the period of time before he actually began active ministry. There was a long period of time. So the Lord was very clear in that situation. I've often wished he would be that clear, <laughs> you know, bright light, you know, <laughs> speak. Um, but he was very clear and yet it didn't happen right away. There was this, you know, waiting period, training period, very likely. 
How do you know when the timing is right? Well, I think one of the first things when it comes to knowing the mind of God and the direction that He's leading us is to understand the importance that His timing is not our timing. Mm, yes. And, and over and over again, we would say, Lord, okay, I've learned this lesson. I've learned it twice now. I've learned it three times now. Uh, but He knows, and He knows what's ahead of us. He knows the depth uh, of our personality. And, and so He's at work, I think, in very precise ways in preparing us for, for the next step. Sometimes you don't know until you can look back and the see. Hindsight. Yeah, mm -hmm. Hindsight again, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So waiting is part of the process. Absolutely it is, yeah. God makes everything beautiful in His time. Mm -hmm. It's not our time. time. <laughs> yes. We're yes. like, we want it tomorrow. But I think the waiting is the sweetest intimacy that we can have with Jesus. When we're not in the posture of waiting, we're busy, we're active. There's a different kind of joy and relationship with God. But when we're waiting, we're clinging like a baby <laughs> to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of sweet intimacy there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great perspective shift, that it's, it's a beautiful time, not, you know, just Very to be true. so anxious. Yeah. yeah. When Jesus invites us to follow him, he doesn't hide the fact that we will encounter desert experiences and challenges along the journey. It is during these times we will learn things we would never learn in places of comfort. And what a difference to know that we are not alone on this journey. He is with us every step of the way. I think that's something to remember. Let's let His light shine in us and through us so we can act as guides through darkness and lighthouses in the storms. When we live our lives as light in the world, we can have a positive influence on those around us. Not so that people are drawn to us, but that God shines through us for His glory. Join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcast. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Join Brett McBride next week for a new, insightful three-part series showcasing international missions. This is Living Truth. So we pour out our praise to 
cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.